Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ali, for organizing this uh, to lead Pakistan, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to meet Afreen again. Uh, it is one of those circumstances where uh, middle-aged academics, myself, have a deep sense of insecurity around a younger academic like Afreen. Uh, she is a research scientist at MIT and associate director of the MIT Strategic Engineering Research Group. And she has degrees in mechanical engineering, aeronautics and astronautics, and aerospace systems. But through all of this uh, sort of very interesting uh, technical skills, she also brings to the table a set of insights on the food, uh, water, and energy nexus, something that I've heard quite a bit about, but I happen to know very little about. So I look forward to it being an extremely educational experience for myself and the rest of the audience over here. And without further ado and boring you with any of my lame jokes, I'd let uh, Afreen take over. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Danish. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, uh, Mr. Ali Sheikh. I met him in Vienna last month, and it's a real pleasure to, to be here. He generously invited me to attend, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, uh, so, uh, just to start off from where uh, Danish left off, my background is in engineering, as you all heard, but for the past several years I've been uh, looking at questions of uh, policy uh, and technology related to resource use, particularly water use, energy use, and food. Uh, the talk that I'll be giving today touches specifically on water scarcity because this is a question of uh, urgent concern in the country and something that I've been actually thinking about for quite some time. I wrote about this a little a while back and uh, as an op-ed uh, in the Express Tribune a few years back and posed this controversial question asking that we do think about water scarcity, but is there a future in which we can envision uh, surplus in the country? And I'm posing this in a controversial way. Hopefully it will grab your attention. And I'll apologize for the meandering thought <laughs> I'll be sharing with you over the next hour or so. Uh, I've, I've tried to make it semi-coherent, but we'll see. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to walk through three questions that I sort of posed in thinking about this question of scarcity and thinking about a new vision for water security in the country. So the first one that I'll start with is how is scarcity defined? Uh, when we talk about water scarcity, what exactly are we talking about? And the most common measures that are used in discussing water scarcity, are, these, are, are they really sufficient measures and are they real predictors for human well-being and economic growth? Because ultimately that is what we're concerned about. When we're talking about water scarcity, we're essentially concerned about human well-being and we're talking about economic development, uh, uh, ultimately. Second question I'll be, uh, I'll be discussing is the role of technology in managing and addressing scarcity. Is there a future, is there a possibility in which we can in, sort of invent ourselves out of the issue of scarcity? Uh, and I'll share some thoughts on that. And then the third uh, is related to policy and governance. Uh, while I'm an engineer by training, over the years I have acutely, uh, you know, recognized the role of policy and the role of governance, the role of social behavior, and technology alone does not solve all of our problems. So uh, we have to consider this. And, uh, you know, from my own limited perspective, I'm going to share some of my thoughts as, as I see them uh, related to policy and governance in the water realm. Um, so with that, I will get started. Uh, I think I'm going to plan for speaking for about 15 minutes. If there are quick clarification questions, please feel free to stop and ask. Uh, otherwise, hopefully we'll have a discussion at the end. All right, so starting with water scarcity, some definitions. Uh, so probably when you pick up the newspaper or you read some blogs or op-eds or other articles, you uh, most often encounter uh, statements such as, you know, Pakistan is uh, close uh, to reaching, you know, water stress or absolute scarcity and so forth. Where are all those statements or terms coming from? Well, the, the, these are three terms that I will share. They have been uh, defined by the UN. Uh, and this is how they are defined. So water stress is defined for a country when its annual freshwater renewable water supplies per person are less than 1,700 uh, cubic meters per year. Okay, so this is just a definition that the UN has uh, provided. Similarly for water scarcity, it is defined when the water supplies are below 1,000 cubic meter per person and absolute scarcity when it is below 500 cubic meters. 
where do these numbers come from? They come from various studies and various analysis where hydrologists and various uh, researchers essentially determined that in order to meet the needs for food production, human well-being, so on and so forth, you need at least 1,000 cubic meters of water. On an absolutely, you know, bare minimum level, just for an individual person to survive, you know, the actual threshold is much lower. It's about 50 liters per person per day that you absolutely need for your drinking purposes and basic cleaning purposes. But beyond that, these numbers are much larger. They are taking into account issues for food production and environment and so on and so forth. But these are the numbers that are sort of used as a holy grail. They're used as sort of, you know, these are the thresholds that we simply cannot, you know, surpass. And they're used as measures for defining and determining and predicting where things are going. Is that really the right way of thinking about it? Perhaps, perhaps not. So, so let's see where, where things go when we use these definitions. So uh, typically water availability is defined as the total renewable, uh, or total renewable resources per inhabitant in Pakistan based on FAO's data. There are about, I'm going to uh, sort of round up the figure here, about 247 billion cubic meters per year. These freshwater resources are fixed. There's no new water that is being mobilized. This is what we have, okay? However, on the other hand, the population, as we all know, has been growing. Here's some recent data, uh, the growth showing the total population from 1991. I added the numbers from the latest census, 2017. We're over 207 million now, right? Uh, it basically means that the population has almost doubled uh, in, in, the, in the last 27 years. That's significant growth, right? And what basically that means is that when we put these population numbers against the fixed resources of water, we are going to see a decline in trend. This is just by virtue of the definition. Uh, and what we find is that, of course, uh, while in 1991, maybe I should stand and point out a few things. Uh, 1991, uh, for people with this axis of water availability, uh, we were above you know, 2,000 cubic meters per person. Now we're on our way to passing you know, the 1,000 mark. And this 1,000 mark is known as the water scarcity threshold, right, uh, which has been raising a lot of alarms. But what's that, what does that really mean in the grand perspective and in the global scale? So here's one map which essentially shows water availability. Uh, if I stand here, can everybody see? Or am I walking through? Or, or am I better sitting? <laughs> okay, so here's a map, uh, you know, showing uh, total renewable water resources for an inhabitant. Uh, and you can sort of see, well, there are some dark green right, Canada, Russia, and so forth, that there are many likely regions. Pakistan doesn't stand out in any particular way, if you actually look at it in a global sense. Uh, now, of course, uh, the, the scale is very coarse, uh, so there are a lot of, you know, details that are hidden, so in just a uh, scale of, you know, five levels, there are some important details that are missing, but I'm just going to highlight some, you know, simple cases. So in Pakistan, uh, just by, you know, taking a simple ratio, we're roughly at around 1571 cubic meters per person, right? Uh, but where's our neighbor, Iran? Uh, 1800. Not significantly different. It's a big country, a lot, lot of population, right? Uh, uh, where's Germany? Uh, another 18. So think about Germany, right? An economically developed and advanced country. Uh, certainly, you know, a uh, high, high, high level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, quality of life and so on and so on. But they don't have a tremendous amount of water resources. They're, you know, they're making use of, of the water resources uh, in, in different ways. So what does that mean? I think what that basically means is that while on one level it is important to be cognizant of the issues of declining resources per person, but that is a natural course that will happen whenever there's population growth in a country, number one. Number two, there are countries around the world that are actually doing economically just fine with modest amounts of freshwater resources per person. And then number two, it is also important to think that when we make projections for the future, we shouldn't be thinking just in linear terms. So here's a lesson from history that I always like to share when I'm talking about this. Um, this is a picture from a study that was published uh, uh, by a National Academy of Engineering study in 2008, uh, showing how the U.S. withdrawals fared uh, over various decades uh, in, in the last century. And what you can see is that around you know 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the water withdrawal in the country was increasing, you know, steadily, and that was essentially raising a number of concerns as to where all of this would lead to. 
and there were projections that were made starting from you know late 1960s and then going on to 1970s as to what the future requirements of the water withdrawal in the country would be if things continued uh, along the same trajectory. So if you look at these lines, if you backtrack them, these are the points in time when the projections were made, and these dots show the project the end year to which they were projected to. So you can certainly see that there were all these you know projections being made, which were very alarming. That how on earth you know is the country going to sustain this level of activity? But what happened in reality? Actually, what happened in reality is this dark blue line, which you see that around you know 1980s, 1990s things stabilized, and they have stabilized since then. So the U.S. is not in a water scarcity crisis, if you will, and things have actually turned right. Uh, what what led to this change? Right. So there was a traje rising trajectory and. Well, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a very complex story, and there's no one simple solution, but several experts have, you know, commented on, on it. Uh, there are several driving factors. One was structural change in the economy. The U.S. basically, you know, became an industrialized nation, and the agricultural sector changed significantly. Uh, secondly, uh, particularly in 1970, the Clean Water Act was passed. And the Clean Water Act was actually not about reducing water withdrawals necessarily it was about cleaning the water that you put back into the water uh, bodies. So if you're an industry, if you're a municipality, whatever water you were drawing, you would draw it, but when you discharge your wastewater, you better clean it up before you put it down. This was a Clean Water Act. Essentially, it imposed uh, policies and standards on wastewater uh, use. What that did was actually, in, it created a counter, uh, an, an unintended uh, consequence in a positive way that especially industry, which was using a lot of water, realized that it was much cheaper to draw less water to begin with so that in turn they will have less water to treat and then put back in the water body. So particularly in industries such as the steel industry and so forth that was tremendous user of water, they had eight folds reduction in water use and so forth because it just made sense for them. But it's not that the water became expensive, it's just that the wastewater that they had to discharge had to be cleaned up, which they had to wear the expense for. So the Clean Water Act essentially had also significant impacts, as well as, as I mentioned, the structural and economic shifts. However, uh, you know, there are many other stories in there, but you can certainly see that this is a real case that unfolded for for, for, for an actual situation. And all the while, uh, while the water, um, uh, you know, you stabilize, the economy continued to grow. So it didn't come at the cost of any economic impact or impediments. And this is the argument that I'm making, that even though there are issues of water scarcity and there are issues of, of increasing water efficiency, it does not necessarily have to impact the economy. Here's one case uh, to consider. So just to sort of, um, you know, wrap up, uh, you know, some thoughts on uh, is per capita water availability a sufficient measure and predictor for economic growth? I would say it's not sufficient. There are many other things that go into uh, understanding water scarcity, and particularly when we're talking about economic growth, which is, I think, essentially is, is the underlying issue when we're talking about this. Uh, it is not subjected only to water issues alone. Now, I do understand that Pakistan is an ag agrarian economy. 20% is uh, GDP derives from agriculture, but 20% also comes from industry. Pakistan is also an industrial country. If you look at the GDP trends, the industrial GDP has actually increased. Now, of course, because of energy scarcity and so forth, there have been some real challenges in, 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 uh, um, in that. Uh, but nonetheless, we shouldn't forget that there are these emerging trends that may radically shift, and I hope will shift for the better, the needs for water uh, within the country. Also recognizing that 70% of Pakistan water resources go into agriculture. So there is a tremendous cushion and possibility uh, in actually diverting some of that water for municipalities where there is greater use for water and need for water and then green efficiencies in agriculture. So I'll close with that. Now moving on to the second question that, okay, uh, I, I hope you know I've shared some thoughts on, on how do we go about thinking about scarcity measures and so forth. Um, is there a way forward? Um, as I explained in the U.S. case, right, there was uh, you know um, a lot of industry uh, brought in new innovation for reducing water use and so forth. Uh, can we think about you know the role of technology in managing addressing scarcity in the country? Uh, and can we invent our, ourselves out of, of this uh, situation in Pakistan? So I'll start again with sort of a broader perspective. So how many of you know about Thomas Malthus? Uh, uh, I, I see some heads uh, nodding, right? Okay, some thumbs down. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll, I'll go over. So, so the question of technology is very salient uh, uh, um, in, in this situation. So essentially the, um, 
so Thomas Baltus was a British economist. Uh, he's, he's fairly well known for people who work on, on natural resources use and so forth. And he essentially observed acutely that population, human populations grow geometrically or exponentially, whereas land on our planet is finite. And essentially the land that we can acquire for cultivation it grows arithmetically. So if, so if you think there's one curve that's going linearly and one curve that's going exponentially, eventually we're going to run out of land, we're going to run out of finite resources, and that's going to bring the population collapse. We're just not going to be able to sustain the human population because our resources are finite and limited. So on one level, this is certainly uh, very uh, sound. Uh, it certainly makes a lot of sense. And he had actually predicted that the world population would start collapsing uh, in, in about 200 years. That has not actually happened. Um, what has happened is that technology uh, and innovation has consistently shifted, uh, you know, the curve uh, of production and productivity and deals. And so far, we have averted uh, the predictions that Thomas Malthus made. Uh, will this always be the case? Probably not. I think in some level, in some cases, we are hitting, you know, uh, some um, some barriers. So we are hitting. Uh, you know, some limits to growth, absolutely. Uh, but by and large, uh, technology has actually played a major role uh, in in allowing us to continue to, re to use our resources uh, more and in some cases more efficiently. So here's the plot um, at, a, at a grand scale of human population. So here's the sort of first agricultural revolution. This is sort of organized agriculture 10,000 years ago for human civilizations. And then you can sort of see the human population increasing. In the 21st century, it essentially just uh, you know shifted uh, uh, shifted the curve entirely. And what has led to that? A lot of people think it's because of the second agricultural revolution. Essentially, abundance of food, more technologies that allow more food to be produced, and therefore able to sustain more human population. And, and you can sort of see the exponential growth. This is the same story that has played out in our slide. Uh, I'm showing you the global map, but this is pretty much that has also happened uh, in Pakistan as well. Um, and uh, you can sort of see that uh, this is the uh, uh, build out of uh, canals in Punjab over the last century. And, and as you all know, uh, the population in Punjab was not at the same level as it is today. Food production is not uh, at the same level as it, today, as it was before the canals were built. It was pretty much, you know, arid. Uh, land, but because of this construction of canals, uh, I would say intervention of technologies and this rapid build out of the system, we were able to essentially uh, um, move large amounts of water over extensive areas of land and produce uh, the, the agricultural commodities that are produced today. And of course, you know, a lot of construction happened since uh, 1960 as well. So the point is that a lot of technological interventions allowed us to harness and use more water and then produce. But now, are we reaching the limits of that production? Well, uh, here's one um, uh, interesting analysis that was recently done. It was published last year, uh, which essentially analyzed the historical trends of the total irrigation requirement uh, in, in Pakistan and then sort of projected it for the future. Um, so what you can certainly see, what you can see, are three plots. The first is uh, the groundwater requirement for uh, the agriculture that happens in the country. Uh, surface water supply at the field level, which you can sort of see that slightly increased over time as more canals were built and so forth, but it has actually stagnated since then. We're not able to divert more surface supplies. It's pretty much tapped out of the system, right? Uh, and here's the total irrigation requirement, uh, okay, which combines the surface and, and groundwater. Um, and what the projections basically show for the future goes something like this if things continue on this is a new trajectory. That of course the surface supply is not going to change. Uh, however, the total irrigation requirement will continue to go up as people try to plant more crops, as they try to grow more food, and so forth. And that basically means that groundwater is going to supplement those additional supplies because the surface supply is pretty much fixed. So wherever they're going, they bring the water that they're bringing, and they're not getting any new supplies, as we all know. So, is this really a sustainable trend? I would say absolutely. Uh, and is there a possibility where we can now buck this trend and change these curves to a more sustainable trajectory? That's a question to ask. And can technology help in doing that? Uh, let me also add to this picture that as more and more groundwater supplies are tapped, you're also tapping into supplies that are not of the best quality. This is also an interesting map that, that came out, uh, which uh, shows the uh, 
the water quality, the groundwater quality, uh, and you can certainly see that particularly in Sindh, uh, how extensive this, the, uh, the situation is in terms of poor quality. And this quality impacts you as we all know. So while we're trying to produce more, using more water, we're also using water that is also not of the best quality, particularly in certain regions, and thereby impacting production. So we're sort of caught in this, uh, in this sort of you know, uh, unproductive cycle, as I would say. In addition, while the salinity question is sort of well understood and has been researched and discussed and talked about for a lot of uh, years now, there are these emerging issues also that I think better concern uh, as they relate to quality. In particular, I, I'd, I'd like to highlight the issue of arsenic, right? Uh, so there was a recent study published last year uh, by actually some researchers at MIT who did a very extensive field work in Bangladesh and they uh, looked at the impact of uh, groundwater arsenic on the yield of rice uh, harvest, right? So now Bangladesh has had arsenic problems for quite some time. They're well documented, but this was a very rigorous study done at the field level to see well, what impact, if any, does it have on rice production. A lot of the studies previously had just focused on human health, on drinking water supply, and so forth. This was looking at agricultural productivity. And what that study found was that up to 26% of the annual harvest field loss could be attributed to arsenic in the soil, which was basically coming in because of irrigation of groundwater, which is what is happening in Bangladesh. Well, the story sounds familiar, doesn't it? In Pakistan also, a lot of rice uh, and other crops are irrigated by groundwater. Uh, and when we put this picture along with the recent paper that came out, perhaps many of you know, uh, in, um, in science, so it was a great team and a very interesting study. Uh, it came out last year, which essentially showed uh, through extensive uh, data samples of about 1,200 groundwater wells in the country showing that arsenic uh, levels are extremely high and actually exceed WHO levels in several areas. So this was a very, uh, I think, interesting and important uh, finding. I'm sure there's probably other work that's happening. This is a picture from that paper essentially detailing uh, the levels of arsenic. Uh, by the way, so the WHO guidelines 10 uh, milligrams per liter, and you can so, so, so certainly see all these yellow, red, and purple dots that are pretty much all over the country. So this is the groundwater that is also being used not just for municipal supply, but of course, uh, uh, you know, this is the same groundwater that people are pumping to irrigate their fields. So what does that mean when we know the results in, in Bangladesh that up to 25% of yield losses are because of arsenic? So I think there are these emerging, uh, there, there is this emerging knowledge uh, that needs to be sort of uh, looked at in more detail. Of course, the study that I'm citing is from Bangladesh. I think there should be work that, that should be done here to really understand what are the implications of Pakistan. And going beyond the traditional measurements of salts and salinity and so forth, there are these other contaminants that have uh, historically not been adequately looked at or understood, and they apparently uh, uh, may be causing significant um, uh, dents in, in the production, right? So while we have so focused a lot on water quantity, uh, right? We do talk a lot about the scarcity issue, we do talk about, you know, uh, the water availability, but I do think the quality issue uh, needs significant attention, and by addressing the quality issues, understanding it better, and mitigating it better, we may have higher levers, perhaps, in certain areas particularly, to actually impact in a positive way and increase production and so forth. Okay, so, so and, and how do we impact this quality? Well, here's the, here's the role for technology. Okay. So here's where technology could potentially come in. Uh, now, the good news for when we talk about saline, saline groundwater is that brackish groundwater is much easier to desalinate. There are all these technologies that are out there uh, that are cheaper. Uh, they are uh, much, uh, very, very uh, much mature and being used in, in a variety of countries around the world. Um, they are also, uh, the recovery rate for brackish groundwater desalination is much higher than seawater desalination. I'm sure many of you are aware of seawater desalination desalination systems are used extensively in the Middle East for municipal supply. The brand groundwater treatment is something that should be closely looked at, particularly in a country like Pakistan where groundwater plays such an important role. Uh, secondly, um, some of the uh, some of the most you know common and promising technologies uh, for desalination are reverse osmosis and electrodialysis. I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm just highlighting them that these technologies are now well developed and mature. Uh, previously, these technologies were very energy intensive, particularly reverse osmosis. These are membrane-based technologies, uh, very high energy demands. Now they're almost reaching you know sort of the thermodynamic threshold uh, for for energy efficiency. So you need about you know pointing. 
uh, you know, kilowatt hour, uh, kilowatt hours to remove the salt from, uh, you know, cubic meter of water, uh, and now they are operating at you know, 1.5 kilowatt. They're almost reaching, you know, the best physical, you know, limit that you can get. So they're not as energy intensive as they previously used to be. There have been a lot of improvement in these technology that they are being adopted. Uh, secondly, electrodiocese, this is another type of uh, technology that has been used at a large scale for cleaning brackish water, particularly in Japan and so forth. Now, the question is, a lot of the treatment, of course, has happened in municipalities for providing drinking water supplies. And when we start talking about agriculture, we are really talking about a different scale altogether. So I, I totally do understand that. But there are use, there is use of treated water, uh, particularly again in the Middle East for agriculture in particular areas. Now they're very widespread, so for them it actually makes sense uh, to, to, to use some of these technologies. But, uh, but what I'm sort of putting out here is that these different systems uh, can be built and designed and operated at different scales. Uh, and there's probably a role for different uh, sizes of these systems in different locations for impacting agricultural productivity and livelihoods and so forth. Uh, so we have to think about this more from this perspective, and in some cases, these uh, systems may be feasible uh, for use uh, uh, for various sectors, in addition to bringing water use, but also for limited cases for agricultural production. Okay, so so what uh, what I just like to share with you is this picture that I normally you know uh, conceive of uh, in thinking about you know water supply. Uh, so there are typically three sectors. Uh, that are considered when we're talking about water supply questions, right? So agriculture, municipalities, and industry. And they exist at different scales across cities, and provinces, and the national scales, and so forth. And if you think about, you know, how can we provide water, again, touched upon the issue of scarcity and, and, and connecting with technology, uh, there are these four, you know, options that one can consider, right? Uh, so one is you can do intersectoral freshwater reallocation. This is sort of the easiest one you can do, right? So you essentially transfer some water uh, from one sector to another. So typically, if you look at the graph for many countries that are water stressed, what you will find is that over time there has been a shift from agriculture to cities because it, essentially this is the, the in, in, inevitable, in, in, inevitable uh, you know, uh, trend that happens that people first need water for drinking and for survival, and then uh, you know, later water goes for agriculture. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, you know, you can also transfer water from industrial use to municipalities and so forth. There are also, also these other links, so cross-sectoral uh, cross wastewater region we use, where you can divert uh, treated wastewater from municipalities for agricultural use, for industry. We have limited uh, use of that in Pakistan, right? In Faslaba, there's some limited uh, use of wastewater for agricultural production. Uh, of course, it's not at a large scale and so forth, but these are real options that are, uh, that are implemented uh, in countries around the world. So in Jordan, actually, which I will share with you an example in the next slide, uh, I've, I've visited a few times. It, it is one of, it is the fourth most uh, water poorest country in the world. Okay, so Jordan is like, uh, you know, they're 143 cubic meters per person per year, uh, right? So they're about a quarter of magnitude less than the water available in Pakistan. But they're still doing agriculture. It's another question whether it's sustainable or not, uh, and they're supporting a population in the right. How are they doing it? Well, if you look at their trends, what happened was that they diverted a lot of water, fresh water from agriculture to the municipal sectors, and then they're reusing the wastewater from the municipal sector to the agriculture. This is a trend that you know happens in countries, that is happening in countries already. Should we be doing it? It's an open question. Every country has its own ge geography, own, own environment, and own reality. And here's the example for, for Jordan that I'm sharing with you, that actually municipalities are using desalination, uh, a lot of leakage reduction, and then essentially uh, transfers from municipality to wastewater to for industrial goods and agriculture and so forth. What should this picture look like for Pakistan? Well, we need to do analysis. We need to do systems analysis where, you can, where we can identify the optimal uh, options and optimal strategies and policies where we can understand what these links should be and what would make the most sense for Pakistan given its particular needs for agriculture and its its particular water environment. Uh, and I think if you think about this picture uh, in a holistic way, we can probably uncover new solutions, we can uh, uncover more optimal solutions and so forth. Um, uh, in particular, you know, these blue circles, what these blue circles mean are essentially uh, water that you can free up and provide to additional users in the system by efficiency measures. So by leakage reduction, by new technologies and so forth. So how fast 
these arrows should be uh, is a matter of you know investments in technology. So there's a lot that is hidden behind here that I won't get into, but I'll just you know sharing some high level thoughts here with you. In particular, I think the, there's a lot of scope in thinking about uh, using uh, wastewater, uh, treated wastewater from municipalities, particularly large municipalities for peri-urban agriculture. So when you look at the census data from Pakistan, we have a number of very large cities of uh, several million strong, uh, and uh, and there's certainly you know opportunity in thinking about more in, uh, creatively and uh, boldly about about this option, and particularly also for municipalities and industries. So when we're talking about cities such as Karachi and Faslabad and so many others, where there's a big industrial base as well. As well as a large <clears throat> uh, a domestic uh, use of water, uh, there are certainly opportunities for treating the water and then reusing it for industrial needs and so forth. Okay, um, so so this is what I will just sort of share on on the technology issue, and then I'm going to move on to thinking about you know policy and, and governance. Um, uh, what are some policies needed for addressing water scarcity? Uh, I don't have a solution. I'm just going to share some 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 thoughts uh, here, uh, and then also importantly, how has governance impacted scarcity? I'll also share some recent work that we've done in in looking and understanding this uh, looking at this question. If I can understand. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so I'm going to first start with actually sort of the, the national perspective when we're talking about policies, and I'm going to start with trade. Uh, I'm sure many of you may be familiar with the issues here. I'm certain, I'm, uh, I'd like to highlight them because I do think that they're very critical and important. Um, this is a paper that came out uh, almost three years ago, and this was very interesting. Um, if you notice, uh, so what this paper essentially showed, what this study showed was uh, uh, how the trade in agricultural commodities, uh, uh, what the trade in agricultural com commodity means for uh, water transfers between countries, right? So when we're as we're using water to grow various crops and produce various uh, outputs, uh, and then essentially export those outputs, essentially we are exporting, uh, uh, you know, the water that was locally available in the country in a virtual way to other countries that are now using those goods. Um, so if you can see that these are the top countries in the world uh, uh, in terms of producers uh, for agricultural commodities, and you can see that Pakistan is one of them. So we're not just uh, you know a country that is producing a lot of food for its own people. Pakistan is on the global map when we're talking about agricultural commodities and trade and food production. Right. So here's Pakistan, and you can sort of see where the uh, produce is going. Uh, but what does this really mean for Pakistan to be on the map and for it to be exporting a lot of water when we're seeing all those unsustainable trends in the trajectory, and particularly from the groundwater withdrawal? I think that really needs to be put in perspective and understood and, and looked at. So what has really happened, if you look um, at this uh, picture here, I think this is very telling. I should just use this mouse. Could it work on here? This <laughs> might be easier. Um, what is really telling is <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mouse in the air doesn't work as well. You need a flat surface. <sighs> this is a five minute break. <laughs> They're past the half hour anyway. <laughs> So while we fix the technical issues. <laughs> so Pakistan lies about 10,000 liters per capita export of for water intensive commodities. Oh, I think that was just a scale. I'll have to less check what they were showing. Less, yeah. than, less than one for yeah. huh? Less than one for 1,000 or 10,000? I just wanted to show the box. But before we go on, I neglected to mention that this is the 20th in the series that LEAD has been conducting, which is leading perspectives on managed shared basis. So this is a series of talks that have been happening. There's a schedule available uh, with LEAD people who you may want to consult. Uh, so this is an ongoing series. So by all means, look it up and come to the next one as well. And you told me to say that. I forgot to say this. So, so between <laughs> 1,000 and 2,500. I was hoping we'll spend it out there. 
So here's a very telling picture. You can sort of see Pakistan right here. And you can see uh, all the shipments uh, of agricultural commodity and forest implications for water uh, going here. So here's Pakistan, and it's exporting a lot of rice and other cereals uh, to uh, Western Africa, East Africa, uh, of course, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, uh, and, and elsewhere. So you can certainly see that there's a big sort of uh, node uh, in the map here. So you can, I, I hope you can appreciate that this is really significant. It's not just a blip. Uh, this, there's a massive amount of, of you know, trade that is happening and the implications of, of water use in the country and, and what does that mean for sustainability. Okay. Um, wheat for wheat, you can see certainly you know the U.S. is a major exporter, uh, providing uh, wheat exports to a number of countries. But certainly for rice, uh, you can see the importance here in this map. Okay, so uh, so so just to sort of you know uh, highlight this point of global importance, this was a recent uh, study that that came out uh, talking about you know uh, global food security. And Pakistan was mentioned as one of the major uh, leverage points uh, for thinking about global food security because as it is a major producer uh, of uh, food uh, in the world, not the largest, but one of the, one of the key countries. Uh, and the food is produced through largely by irrigation where we're thinking about global food security and we're thinking about global water security. Uh, Pakistan is a country that shows up on the map, all right? Uh, so while we need to think about policies that are important for our own provinces uh, and for the country, the point I'm trying to make here is that we also have a global presence when we're, when we're discussing agriculture, when we're discussing water, and we should be thinking also about globally that how can we play this role in a more sustainable way and, play, and be a part uh, in the global spectrum of uh, thinking about global water food, uh, global water security and food security. Okay, so, so coming down to the next level, um, you know, I talked about trade. Uh, this is the extent to which I wanted to go at, uh, which is certainly something of national uh, national uh, concern. Uh, I'm going to not talk about you know more local level issues, and particularly focus on the provincial scale, uh, given the autonomies that the provinces have, and that the fact that the water is largely managed at the provincial scale, uh, and so forth. Okay, so here's uh, you know one summary for Punjab. I'll start. With Job being the most populous province, the largest province in terms of population in the country, and also the population that produces most of the agricultural production. And, and, and essentially the verdict is that uh, while the agricultural sector is pretty large, by and large it has been stagnating. There have been yield increases in the number of crops and so forth, but by and large if you look at the amount of inputs that are needed for producing the outputs, those inputs are actually increasing. So the sector is becoming more and more inefficient. Uh, so some of our analysis that we did showed that the direct energy intensity has risen 80% uh, uh, over 20 years in Punjab. I should have put a, actually a reference. This was a paper, this was a, a study that we did uh, at MIT uh, looking at you know energy use uh, in agriculture in Punjab. Um, and what we found was that direct energy intensity, which is essentially the energy used at the farm level, so energy being used in tractors and groundwater pumping and so forth, is pretty significant. Uh, the fertilizer use intensity has risen 85%, and total crop production has increased only 31%, right? So while we are having to pump in more and more inputs, uh, the output is not at the same level, right? So we are essentially stagnating. Uh, the cash crops, you know, have shown yield increases, but there are many other crops that have either declined or have stagnated in terms of yields, okay? Uh, and at the district level, there's actually significant variability. Some districts do very well, while other districts have actually been receding in terms of performance. This is just an excerpt from Don. Uh, this is from you know the paper that I did. So this train thing has really been dated, but you get the picture in which they essentially stated that the declining performance of the sector and increased cost of inputs, cost of food per head in the province has gone beyond uh, you know 3,000 rupees. So essentially, the verdict is that the agriculture sector is not really performing at its full potential. And within this sector, there is a tremendous variability. So here's a plot of rice yields that I made, uh, starting from 1987. This is showing 2011 for Punjab. And these box plots essentially show you the minimum and maximum uh, yields across districts. And the red line shows you the median or the average. So you can get a sense of you know, the variability. So some districts have very low yield, while some districts have very high yield. So this is data across 33 districts in Punjab for each year. Okay. So there are some things that you can note. 
One is that over the years, this red line, which is the average yield in the province, has been slowly and steadily trending, climbing upwards, right? So there is that slow increase overall on average in the province. But what you also find is that there's still a significant, you know, disparity. And in fact, in some cases, you know, the low points are still pretty much low. Some districts have just not been able to go ahead, get ahead, while others have, you know, significantly so is that an adequate use of resources? Now, of course, we all know that yield is impacted because of soil quality, water availability. There's so much of the environment that goes into this. But if we consistently see this pattern, what does this tell us? What does this tell us for planning and policy? Should we be growing rice in regions that are just not designed to be growing rice? So on and so forth, right? So one, so one key point is that while we make policies at the provincial scale, the provinces are pretty big. Pakistan is a pretty big country. So when we're talking about the area of Punjab, that's Actually, I don't know how much that is, but it's pretty significant. So there's a lot of variability uh, in terms of soil condition, environment, and so forth, and we should really be leveraging that variability for optimizing our production and thinking about policy and so forth. Similarly, the same story is for wheat. Uh, you can see uh, here's a uh, plot that we made for wheat yields, uh, and you can see that for certain regions it's not as much, and for other regions, you know, it's two times uh, some of the other districts. Uh, so, so there's you know these optimal uh, places and optimal regions that are, are perhaps better and some others are not so much for, for production and we should be really be very careful in thinking about diverting our resources of water and, and many other inputs uh, as we uh, go about our business of agriculture. Uh, so this was a story for Punjab that is the sector is sort of stagnating and there's tremendous variability. So if we harness that variability, we could potentially increase our overall performance. Now I'm going to turn to Sindh which hosts the Indus Delta, right? Uh, he, this was a very interesting study that came out um, 2013, and I actually happened to listen to this presentation. It was made some time back uh, in Germany in Bonn at the Global uh, Water Systems Project Conference, and the title of the uh, of the presentation was "Death of a Delta." So it was pretty riveting, pretty you know stark. Uh, and the delta they were talking about was the Indus Delta, right? And and this is the uh, the study that they did, uh, which essentially showed. Uh, that in this delta, of course, we know has been eroding, but essentially quantified it, and they, their analysis uh, showed that up to 25% of the land has been lost since 1940, mostly because of the large scale dams as well as diversion. So what happens is that the sediment flow that previously used to reach the delta has been severely restricted. We do know that Mangla is filling up, the Vela is filling up, we know the sediment issues, right? So while we're collecting the sediment upstream, it is not going downstream where it used to be deposited and, and create the fresh uh, and you know the, the abundance that previously used to exist. So they quantified it that almost a quarter has degraded, which is I think quite stunning. Uh, here's a map showing the land that has been lost. Uh, so what you see here is in the yellow regions uh, the land that has eroded between 1944 and 2000. So all of this area uh, has been lost. Previously it was part of the delta. Now new areas have grown because of course the water movement has been impacted. So the blue regions show new land that has been deposited. But overall, I'm just showing you a piece of the map, but look at the entire region, they find a net loss uh, in, in the Delta region, right? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, that means that agriculture in Punjab is stagnating. The Delta in Sindh is eroding. And of course, I can show you pictures of, you know, the forestry situation in KPK and so on and so forth. So what that really means is that we need a fresh look and really, I think, a bold uh, and an ambitious uh, strategy in thinking about how do we, you know, manage these water issues in a more locally specific way. So, so you know, I'm just going to share some pictures uh, that KPK, right, has the majority of the forest lands in the country, uh, which has an impact and, and uh, um, uh, implications for water. Uh, Balochistan, right, is the province uh, that has most minerals. Why am I highlighting Balochistan? Not a lot of agriculture. Certainly we do get some nice cherries from there, but it's not the main well, minerals, right? And a lot of mining activities require water. And I have yet to see analysis and yet to see actually uh, studies coming out talking about what are the implications of all the mining activity that is going on in Pakistan on its water. And I think it's really critical to understand. There have been some studies that came out initially. There were some uh, uh, studies that also were talking about shale gas and so forth that it's used for water. Uh, but by and large, there's a big knowledge gap and a big hole in understanding on what has been the impact and will be, will be the impact of continued mining operations in Pakistan on water resources and so forth. Okay, um, 
for Punjab, of course, as I mentioned, it's our largest agricultural province, and Sindh hosts the Indus Delta. Why am I showing all these pictures? Just to sort of illustrate that our provinces are very different. So when we talk about agriculture in Pakistan, it's a much more complex story. When we talk about water in Pakistan, it's a much more complex story, right? And what I'm calling for, what I'm proposing is that we need basically policies and we need to think about strategies that are specific and strategic to the specific provinces. So for instance, for Sindh, I would actually, you know, be very interested in, in, in studies and uh, and in evaluation in which one can look at how can we divert perhaps some of the fresh water, reduce some of the groundwater that is saline groundwater that's being pumped, and actually divert it for restoring the delta in the Indus, which in turn may increase the fisheries, which may in turn increase the protein production that the delta can provide, and overall may bring more economic benefit and more value for the delta rather than doing low value stagnating agriculture in the province. So the provincial authorities should deeply you know, think about their provincial share that they get and how can they best use that? Should they be diverting it to a low performing sector or can they uh, uh, you know, create a more rejuvenated and, and a more uh, productive sector through fisheries in the Indus Delta by rejuvenating and cleaning it up? Secondly, uh, for KPK, of course, where the forests are, uh, you know, ecotourism is, is a big deal. Uh, I won't go into details of that, uh, but what is currently happening is that there are no policies to protect our forests enough. There's tremendous degradation. I've been going to the northern areas ever since I was little, so I, I, I see for myself firsthand. <laughs> I see I, I see firsthand what the status is. So that is extremely, you know, I think dangerous, of course, from an environmental disaster perspective, but from a productivity perspective, it's lost opportunity. And one that really should be looked at in, in serious ways that uh, should all the agriculture that is happening in KPK as well as its share, uh, where is it best used and where is it best served? Can we do sustainable forestry, sustainable harvesting of, of timber and, and trees and so on and so forth, as well as sustainable ecotourism and, and so on? Uh, Balochistan, as I mentioned already, the impacts of mining and water resources, I think is absolutely critical and important. And Punjab, you know, still hosts a tremendous potential for increasing its productivity. It is the fertile plain, it is the plains where, you know, the Indus uh, has been, you know, uh, depositing its sediments uh, for millennia, and, and where there's tremendous opportunities for improving uh, and harnessing the variabilities that we see and in increasing overall production. So in the end, what I'm going to do is close with some uh, thoughts, uh, some, uh, some uh, and some overall thoughts on, on inclusive development. Um, uh, we've started some work on looking at uh, and thinking about you know, large scale systems. So when we're talking about dams, we're talking about canals, and we're talking about major investments, uh, we typically you know, evaluate these systems through cost benefit analysis. And typically, the cost benefit analysis is done at the national scale. You get the GDP impacts, so, or maybe at the provincial scale at best. But there is no analysis that is done at a population distribution level. And how will different groups be impacted? How can perhaps we make investments that can more adequately address the concerns of different population groups? And how does the management of our systems impact uh, the system at a subscale? Uh, so you're happy, you're welcome to read some of these initial thoughts. I'm just going to share some recent work that we just did and we are doing um, using. Um, uh, irrigation data in Punjab to highlight the issues of equity. Uh, so uh, here's what you see is uh, the actual irrigation deliveries and entitlements uh, for the Tel Canal. This is, you know, sort of the first canal that branches off, right, the main step of the Indus in Punjab. Uh, now, what you see here is red lines are the actual, sorry, the red lines are the entitlements and the blue lines are the deliveries. This is at the canal scale, by the way. So I'm not talking about farm level or water force which has been studied significantly for, for many decades where we do know the issues of head to tail inequity. I'm talking about the main massive canal that is running. This is uh, you know the deliveries and entitlements for that main canal and I'm just showing the data for the last 11 years. This data is reported by Punjab Irrigation Department. This is not our own data. This is the data that is published by the uh, Punjab Irrigation Department uh, on the website. And what you can see here are these curious features. So what I've plotted here is essentially the the total, entire, the total uh, cumulative delivery uh, balance uh, over the season for each year. So each year there is a total balance that is given to each canal. So whether it will be given, you know, 3 million acre feet or 2.5 million acre feet 
and then it is the water is released on a 10 daily basis, right? So, but at the beginning of the season, each kilan is given an allocation based on the water availability in the reservoirs and the expected availability that they expect throughout the season. So, each year in Rabi and Kharif, there is an entitlement that is made based on the existing availability for that year and how that's going to be then distributed across the system, across the 25 canal and up. And what you can see here is that at the beginning of the year, right, there is some balance that is given. At the end of the year, it should draw down to zero, meaning all the water has been provided, that it was due. But what you see is that this black line doesn't touch the zero line, meaning that, you know, there was an outstanding balance. It didn't get the water that it was originally allocated at the beginning of the season. And this is the calculus. The main canal, the first one, that's, so I'm not talking about anything about, you know, uh, diversions here or there. What this is essentially highlighting, and then you see it year after year. So what, what is this showing? Can anybody, you know, share some of their thoughts? Of what, 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 what does this picture tell them? Uh, when I saw this, I was really surprised. <laughs> but I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, with the interest, interest of time, I'll, I'll sort of volunteer my, my own impressions, which was that there's a severe a lack of uh, forecasting accuracy and there is a severe need for improving our management and allocation because if year after year our major canal the first canal that comes out of the system is unable to meet its allocation quota and then year after year then that means that there are some process uh, improvements that need to be made some management improvements that need to be made that when the allocations are being made at the beginning of each season, this is for Kharif, you can sort of see the same for us. At the beginning of each season, each year, when the allocations are being made, we should have a better process forecasting how much water will be available and a better process for knowing how much we will actually be able to deliver. Because one year to the next, you know, sometimes things may, uh, uh, may be different. But this is water that is in the reservoir. This is not water that we're sitting on the rain, so there's a lot of unexpected stuff. This is more than just control over. And if we're not even able to properly manage and allocate the water uh, at the canal level, uh, I think it really highlights uh, needs and opportunities for improving our process for allocation and forecasting and management. This is a story of Tal Canal. This is a story for all the 25 canals. I'm not going to, you know, sort of go into all the details, but I'll just highlight, you know, sort of two points here. One, which is that if you look at sort of decadal data, what you will find is that some canals do just fine. So one means that the, the allocation, the entitlement of delivery was pretty much, you know, I'm just plotting the ratio here. But for some other canals, year after year, it's below one, which means that year after year, the allocation is not met, uh, right? So the actual delivery does not meet the actual allocation. So year after year, over a decade of this is unfolding, then that really means that we need to seriously think about how our allocation is being made and how our uh, the canal system uh, and, and the overall irrigation system. And what does that mean when I highlighted those two red boxes? This is what I mean by inequity, right? So if one canal is getting, you know, its allocation and delivery pretty much, you know, to be on the same level as it should be, and another year after year is below, that means that in the context of the system, we essentially have consistent and persistent issues that really should be looked at and not everybody is getting, you know, what they expect to get. So here I'm not talking about fair share. Here I'm not talking about, you know, what is the right share. I'm just saying whatever the allocation was made, was that actually delivered? And if we look at that very basic level, I think there's tremendous opportunity for improvement here. Uh, what I'm plotting here is, um, uh, you know, essentially the, uh, 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 the summary of all the data that you were showing, these are blocks plots. So again, you sort of see the average value and the minimum and maximum. Uh, and there's one trend that I would point out, that over the years, this box has actually gotten fatter. It basically means that there's more uh, diversity, that, that, that there's more dispersion in the data. So some canals are getting you know, more and, and some less. And this is at the canal level, again, just to remind you. So we're not talking about farms at all here. Uh, so essentially, just repeating what I just said, that. Uh, this reveals an opportunity for, for new process for setting our seasonal allocations and for higher frequency margin to enhance equity in the system. Um, all right, so I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to now close with some uh, uh, last remarks. And I'm going to come back to, you know, what I started with when we're talking about, you know, water scarcity uh, at the national level and, and structural uh, change, which is that when we think about, you know, uh, addressing some of these issues all the way from quantity to quality to access, uh, we 
we should keep a few picture, a uh, few things in mind. One is that uh, the issue of water access, as, as well as of water quantity, uh, can be radically changed if the economic, if the economy or the structure of the economy, you know, changes. So here's some example of four countries: of Turkey, Egypt, Iran, and Jordan. These are primarily largely agricultural countries in the 1960s. Turkey has industrialized significantly, so you can see in 2010, you know, agriculture is not that much of a share of its GDP as it historically was, right? And then similarly, you can see for other countries. So you saw the case for the U.S. as well. Essentially, the point being, the country can continue to grow if it shifts um, its economic activities to activities that are both matched with the resources that it has. Um, that is one point I'd like to make. So when we think about future projections, uh, we should we should keenly think about how can we bring a structural change in the economy. We have a large dependence on agriculture. Perhaps some of the non-productive dependence on agriculture can be reduced, which would free up our water for other uses and more productive uses. That's the point I'd like to make. And then how do we free up this water? How do we reduce this non-productive use of water, uh, if you will? So here's a story that I saw in the Daily Times. It was published four days ago. I was flying to Karachi in you know, one of the newspapers that was given to me in the plane. And it was you know, very interesting. So here's a snapshot of that, uh, of that news story, which was essentially talking about uh, the lives of dwellers in the Indus Delta and how difficult it is for them to get by. They're living on the Delta, and they have barely any access to water. So, so this is a story of this one uh, uh, farmer who essentially keeps livestock, uh, camels and, and others. Uh, uh, and then, but he has to take his boat uh, to, I think, uh, you know, KP Bandar or something in Karachi, and he has to bring fresh water for his family, and it's just very hard living. But the last paragraph, uh, I think, shows us the key for how to bring about this structural change in the economy. So the, so the farmer says, there's so many problems here, it's very difficult for me to consider leaving this place. Uh, moving probably requires a lot of money. This area belongs to my forefathers and I was born and raised here. I don't have any other skills except for fishing. So if I move somewhere else, what will I be doing there? This, this is ultimately the issue, that what we really need is to think about, now here I started to talk about water and scarcity, but I'm really going to talk end with the discussion on education, investment in education, and investment in training, and thinking about livelihoods of people. Not everybody has to be an engineer or a doctor, and probably, you know, the fishermen uh, perhaps could do also some other more productive things if the environment of the system is changing. But he's essentially stuck in a very low quality of life, and in... Uh, in, in a situation where uh, you know they're trapped because they don't know anything else to do. This is the same story, by the way, that plays out in region after region. You know, I've attended so many workshops uh, of water resources issues for so many countries, and this issue is always the case. A lot of people are doing agriculture, they don't know anything else. What else are they? And then therefore they draw upon the water resources in unproductive ways, but you know, they have to earn a livelihood. So we really have to start thinking about livelihoods of people. Um, so this is the last uh, uh, the slide up here, uh, and essentially the main message is that you know uh, there, you know, the policies and technologies and action. I think that is needed uh, to create a future of surplus. Certainly, we realize what we really need is public awareness and demand from the public and political will and sustained support. All right, great. That was an absolutely brilliant and most informative uh, presentation, Catherine. Thank you so much for that. Uh, may I propose that we take like a five minute comfort break and then reconvene? And then we can have some questions and answers in sort of uh, more interactive sort of format. So, five minutes just to stretch. Is that humanitarian? Yes. Yes.
should be doing is taking a hard look to see how are they using their water resources and how can they make any allocations and reallocations between the various uses that are happening. And there might be an opportunity for SIN uh, to perhaps use its share to provide more fresh water leases to the Delta if there is a case to be made that there can be more productivity in the Delta versus some of the low value agriculture that is happening in the province. So in terms of a short question, I don't know. I haven't done the analysis, but this is sort of these are you know ideas that I'm putting forth for people to really take a hard look at, who have the ground data and the ground knowledge uh, to do a more detailed work on this. Just a comment on this one. This delta was designed by nature with 280 billion cubic meters of circulating right. water coming right. each year. Then, for one century, all those developers has cut it down to less than 20. So, put share of sin, which is peanuts. So the share of sin is not peanuts, it's half. I mean, it's, it's the second, right? After Punjab, Punjab has the largest, and then Sindh has, has, has the second largest. Uh, but in terms of, you know, there, there's a bigger question of just freshwater availability. You're talking about the sediment as well, and I touched upon that. A lot of sediment actually gets trapped up, which is also connected to this issue. And, and these are things that we really have to think more seriously about. We do know that, you know, of course, the dams are, some of them are filling up pretty quickly. Uh, you know, their lives are almost, uh, you know, um, they're, they're maxing out. Uh, I don't know what the impact on the sediment flow would be uh, beyond a certain level. So we should be looking at that in more detail. Uh, but in reality, I think the main point that I'm making is that this is something that 
should be looked at in more detail. That's all. And and I do think that there are probably pockets of opportunity. So when we talk about you know restoring the delta, we're not talking about taking it to its you know pre uh, you know uh, 20th century uh, state. Uh, what, what we're talking about is that what it makes sense to restore for the 21st century, where we can still get more productivity than what we are currently getting. That that's essential. So we'll have to think about the baseline. We'll have to think about all of those things that you're bringing up. Okay, so second question, uh, you know, uh, talking about arsenic contamination, and if we account for that, I'm sorry, who asked the question? <laughs> uh, and if we account for that for per capita water availability, so no. So this was just, you know, gross per capita water availability, good water, bad water, contaminated water, all of that, you know, not accounted for at all. Uh, and the question of, you know, dams, uh, you know, there's no uh, simple and short answer. There's a very interesting paper that was written by, you know, actually the World Commission on Dams, good dams or bad dams, uh, right? And uh, and they basically discussed at length that, you know, there's a lot that goes into how a dam is built, where it is built, you know, where a large dam makes sense, where it doesn't make sense, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, there are a lot of myriad issues uh, at stake in Pakistan when we're discussing some of the large dams. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I really don't want to oversimplify the, the situation by just giving a broad brush statement. But what I would like to say is that storage is absolutely important for Pakistan. It is important whenever we're talking about water supply. It is important whenever we're talking about supply for anything. Uh, storage is something that is essential, that essentially stabilizes the fluctuations. This is the law of nature, right? We put capacitors in electric circuits to basically so storage is something that is inherently needed when we're talking about supply of resources. Uh, more of a long-term solution. So when they say by 2025 we're not going to have water, we can't just rely on building dams right now. That's so, so what we what we need to rely is on essentially, I would say, you know, all, all pistons firing essentially. That you want really a full, uh, you know, uh, spectrum and broad spectrum uh, effort underway right now for all of the avenues through which you can, uh, you know, uh, impact uh, water supply. So you certainly do want to think about storage, but you also want to think about, you know, addressing the inefficiencies in the system and based it simultaneously. I actually don't think that we should be, you know, sort of delaying or, you know, sort of sequencing our actions. I think the need is that we really should be making these actions simultaneous. And then the, the last one, you know, again, the question of small versus large dams, and then uh, the question that, you know, whether water reducing the water wastage uh, can help shift the picture for water scarcity. So, you know, certainly uh, when we reduce the water wastage at a local level, it can create local impacts for sure. Absolutely, I, I do. Uh, now, I haven't done the analysis. That's why I was showing you the picture, right? Showing you just the picture, but not numbers. That analysis needs to be done. Uh, but overall, at a high level, I do think that at local level, at the city level, perhaps in various scales, uh, the issue of scarcity can probably be, and I do think, uh, you know, very reasonably mediated and effective by looking at the question of waste. There's tremendous losses in the system, you know, both in supply of the municipalities as well as losses in the agriculture sector. So that doesn't change the picture nationally. Uh, you know, that's that's an open question because I think there are a lot of driving factors. So if we start just looking at the ratio of total water availability over that is always going to paint a picture of scarcity. For the but we think about it in more complex ways of, you know, do we have the water that we need for maintaining our livelihoods and maintaining our well-being? Then the question is actually open. Maybe we have more water than we need. We just have to think about how do we, you know, realize those livelihoods and well-being. The question here. Yeah. Actually, I don't have the question, but I have some comments uh, about the presentation. And I hope First thing is, you see, uh, uh, it is all right that uh, these are the different uh, levels given for the water scarcity and water stress countries. Of course, these are the estimation. There are countries who have the less uh, uh, per capita availability of water, but still they are performing more than they are at the center. And uh, the second thing is, you see, you have given the key thing that we must uh, uh, this uh, clean our water after using it in the industrial sector or in the urban sector, you see. Uh, because uh, it is 2 to 3 percent of our total water, which is more than 95 percent we are using in the fresh water, you see. Of course, it will help. It is needed, badly needed. We, should, we must do these things. But the meantime, we have to think about the application of water, which the other 95 percent of the and we, we 
must add the new methods, new technologies, and then uh, you rightly pointed out that uh, we use the 24% of our data land, you see. And this is the cost actually which uh, we are paying for building the dams because the sedimentations are being controlled in the land, you see. And those are not maintained in the data, you see. And I think this situation will be, of course, worse. But the question is now someone has to wheel between two bad things within the dam and then the problem, of course, the people who are. And other thing you see, uh, you talked about the governance issue, uh, like uh, this one uh, in the first Falcon uh, you see, uh, you are right, there is the problem with the predictions to uh, the water delivery and water entitlement, you see. But if you see at the figure, the problem, the less water was supplied in 2008 to 2012, that was the regime of the people's party, you see. They want more water in the same area. And then later on, it, it was improved. So these are the some which I am not saying exactly this is the reason, but there are many reasons you see. And then of course you have rightly pointed out this the arsenic you see concentration in our water uh, because uh, we at Pakistan Agriculture Research Council are very much uh, uh, this uh, concern. We have the concern that uh, and, uh, this European Union has increased uh, their limit you see. Uh, decrease their limit. First it was around 1000 mg per kg, now it is less than 200 mg per kg, like that you see. So uh, we have uh, uh, made some uh, uh, initial studies in which the, in rice, in some rice areas you see the arsenic percentage has been more important than they had. So we are very much uh, uh, in the process of working the project so that uh, can assess the situation in particular in uh, this convention of areas. So, of course, that is the issue. And uh, overall, uh, because you are not the student of water resources, but still, you are you are better than you. Thank you very much. My name is Najib. Uh, I'm a victim of the Bela Dam. I was in class 8 when this whole dam was built. I've seen with my own eyes. I have real time stories in the uh, when my father was struggling hard to, to, to uh, fight for the compensation and all things. But uh, in all that, we have lost everything. Uh, we were told that uh, for the sake of Pakistan, make this uh, the industry in the country. Now we see the Chinese products all over. Even the smallest industrial area are going to China and making their goods. And uh, we were told that the water economy will improve your life. Literally, it has all destroyed. Uh, it has destroyed the forest. It has destroyed the flora and fauna. It has destroyed the culture of those areas. Uh, and now the Haribo. The question is the district uh, Haribo, where it is hosting two dams, uh, which were mostly the politically motivated. Because I've read Harza Engineering Report 111 pages uh, project com completion report. Uh, they, they write that there were technical and financial issues technical and financial issues. But we again see, even with these issues, the government of Pakistan was adamant in changing the design and making it a bigger. Uh, but Haripur, if you read in the uh, uh, Hazara Gazetteer, in the British Gazetteer, this area was called uh, a fruit and vegetable basket. Now there's nothing. Uh, and this is the, uh, the uh, achievement we had. And uh, yes. Please. So that, that was your comment. Yeah. Okay. Since, so since 2015, we don't have rainfall, we don't have snowfalls, and we are talking about dams. We don't have water for the drinking. Uh, this is this looks uh, strange to us. Yeah. Um, is a question or is there a comment? No. Oh, yeah, there are a couple of questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Asif. I'm working in the field of water and climate change. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of uh, questions like uh, uh, you have started your presentation with, with the population growth and uh, decline in, in the water ability. Uh, but you have not uh, pointed out that how, how to control the population at all. <laughs> because, because that is uh, one of the real challenges that how, how can we control the population as well as the, the land use planning again is, is one of the major concerns, I believe. Second thing is uh, you have ignored overall climate change impact issues uh, because uh, snow and glacier covers uh, 
are playing quite a role in producing the water sources. Third one is uh, you have not touched uh, the water productivity and soil productivity at all. Uh, to me, uh, that they, those bits were missing. So how vital are those in overall uh, context of the presentation? Since we just had one question, we could take a couple more. One from the lady about the potential impact. Uh, so my question is regarding agricultural productivity. I think uh, one thing that is also missing is that we are not realizing the economic value of water. So the pricing system that we have right now, or the Aviana system, basically the water charges. So I think it's very low. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I think would be 85 per acre in some job. So how do you how do you see that like the pricing of water when we talk about the economic value? Because I think when we talk about the Murray Darling Basin and how they have managed it, I think they also work in this area as well. Water pricing and realizing I think it helped in a lot of like conservation and also in improving productivity. So how do you think that that's gonna happen? Murray Darling has a lot of work. You mentioned in your presentation about the equal uh, distribution, uh, particularly in the case of Thakana, uh, and you associated that in uh, unequal distribution to forecasting. Is, is it only the forecasting, or there could be other multitude of reasons uh, why the allocated amount was not uh, actually uh, redistributed? So, uh, what's the basis of this analysis? Okay. So, uh, let me start here. So, I'll start with Asif's uh, question. So, so thank you for raising these questions because in the interest of 50 minutes, that became 60 minutes. <laughs> I, I could pack, you know, uh, only so much, and I deliberately didn't touch on the climate change issue because that's a separate talk altogether. <laughs> so, you know, I'll just say one statement that yes, it's it's absolutely important, uh, and one that has critical, uh, you know, consequences for water availability and scarcity. Uh, but I did, didn't uh, uh, address this, yes, uh, but this is something that, that needs uh, active concern. Coming back to the first question in which you said, you know, how do we control the population and how do we address the issue of population growth, recognizing that water is constrained? But Well, I think that, you know, I didn't say it, but the last point that I ended on, on education, if you actually look at analysis in countries, the population stabilizes when the education levels, and particularly for women, increases. And that is something that Pakistan is absolutely you know, behind on. And I don't know what, level, what, what rank we are now in, but we're continually on a, on a downward trajectory. Half of our school age population kids are not in school. I was just reading the newspaper the other day. So, so that is actually a crisis of, of significant proportions. And, and if we do not address this question of education, we are going to continue to see uh, the other impacts and effects that lack of education brings. And that includes population growth, and that includes some of the other issues of livelihoods and so forth that I touched upon. So, so I, I do believe that the data shows this. The history of several countries shows us that when the ed education level rises, the population stabilizes. Uh, and then secondly, on, on the third question of you know, water productivity and soil productivity, I think that uh, th those are certainly you know, important. Uh, what really the, the uh, perspective here for this, you know, my intent here for this presentation was to highlight some points. Uh, I'm not going to be comprehensive. It's impossible, in my opinion, to be so, in, in, you know, uh, on this topic in, in a short period of time. But, but thank you for raising this question. Um, uh, and connected to the water productivity and agricultural productivity question and the Aviana rates, uh, you know, this is... Uh, uh, I think Danish can probably say more on this than I can, who's, a, who's, a, who's an expert on, on the political economy uh, of, uh, and, and, and the, uh, you know, uh, socio-hydrology and, and many other, you know, sort of social aspects and governance as they relate to, to policy. I mean, from a very narrow economic technical perspective, of course, we need to raise up the other rates. And of course, you know, water is not priced adequately. But it's just not as simple as that, and our history of 70 years shows that. Uh, so the solutions uh, are, are are complex, uh, and they, they need to come from from various sectors. Uh, but I will come back, you know, to this issue of education. That's going to be my favorite line here. I do think that when there is greater awareness, greater education, and greater uh, training. Uh, we can probably see a difference. I do know there are political entrenched interests, and a lot of educated farmers will flout the system for their gain. That is absolutely true. 
But I think by and large, we can create a much bigger difference uh, if we improve uh, literacy and education in the country across multiple sectors. Uh, the question of water trading, you know, all of these are very open questions. Uh, you know, there was a very interesting uh, study that was done by actually somebody at Yale, I remember a few years back, looking at the current irrigation system and seeing if it actually allows for water trading. So there are all of this, you know, great work that has been done and thought that has been put in place. And I would come back to this question of political will and public that. Uh, I think they're intimately connected when we're talking about Aviana rates and so forth. I can you know, give you many stories from politicians on when Aviana rates were trying to be raised and what the results were and so forth. That's right. Uh, and then coming back to the last question of, you know, the uh, uh, multiple, re uh, you know, multiple reasons sort of impacting, you know, why we're seeing. So, so you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right that there are probably multiple reasons and I, I have no way of, you know, knowing what those are and I don't claim to know them. What I was just showing you was the data uh, as reported by Punjab Regation. And what that data to me showed was that if an allocation is made uh, at the beginning of the season, so we're not making a 10-year prediction, so this is just, you know, for the next four months, and, and this is, you know, water that is already in the reservoir, and then this is, you know, um, uh, and then, of course, the expected water that is about to come. Uh, and then after, after, you know, this is not the first time that these canals are being operated. So you also know the political economy, and you also know, you know, all the other factors. So my, my sort of impression was that given all the factors that impact water delivery, the management should be accounting for whatever, you know, buffers and, and, and you know, uncertainties and, and whatever else is needed to at least make sure that, you know, the system is, will operate as planned and as, as expected. Uh, now, I'm certainly not saying that they should start buffering for corruption, and I'm certainly not saying that they should start, you know, making, uh, you know, space uh, for unauthorized, you know, practices. Absolutely not. Uh, but I do think uh, that our, our systems of allocation and forecasting are not up to par. There's certainly room for improvement. And again, I want to highlight that this is at the canal scale. This is at a very high scale. So there's certainly opportunity for, for improving this. Absolutely, I do think so. And uh, and then when you see this pattern repeat, then it is really crying out for, I think, action and intervention, that we need to put better processes, processes in place. Okay, we have a question here, then we have a question there, and then we have a question. I was just going to comment on this. Uh, Excuse me. I was just going to comment on I added to a, a similar problem on a much smaller scale, and it drove us nuts why is this happening. And in the end, the answer was, sedimentation they were measuring water quantities under a bridge with marked uh, sort of scales and with different sort of floods and stuff they'd be sedimentation at some period and be flushed out at other periods and it, since it was consistent we came to the conclusion that this is not you know not a socioeconomic sort of phenomenon they had to be some engineering answer for it. and it turned out that measure taking measurements under bridges or you know certain places and at what times uh, actually gives you a very consistent error. Uh, of and th that's precisely what I'm talking about, that these things should be weeded out. It should have been weeded out so years ago. All, all our all our storages are getting sedimented. We have to accept it. We just have to accept, like, what used to be 45 feet is not 45 feet anymore. It's only 39. Simple. We have a question right. here, then we have a question there. Okay. Um, I'm a Brigadier Retired Muslim. My question is very simple, excellent presentation. Uh, the topic was so interesting, I thought on a lighter note, when we going back, I'll have extra water in my pocket. <laughs> but uh, it seems that uh, the situation is not, not good. So if I may ask you, because one, two, three, four, simple governance issues which are and political, what government should do? What as it was? I am a chairman of a Kumbal Damani, what it is a source, civil society. What we should do to mobilize in very simple terms, because we have to take some very stringent actions. Three gorges did not make overnight in 56. There was so much of opposition. In two years, we put uh, Mao Zedong, many people in prison. And why we every time are thinking on building consensus once this is an issue which is of a national level, one should just take the decision. So what you see, because you see from the outside, so is there a need for such consensus or you have to take certain drastic actions? Okay, uh, Alabaksh, if you have the next question. Yeah, my name is Alabaksh. 
my question is uh, I have seen the figures uh, giving per capita water availability in Pakistan, it is reducing whatever. My question is how these figures have been ascertained, whether they have been ascertained from the water sources of Pakistan that are originated from the north. I want to say, I either I want to know, there are still more water sources in Pakistan which are, which are either not calculated or either not counted in this per capita water balance. I mean, in Balochistan, there are 17 water vessels, and one report says that they create annually one, 10 billion acre water field, and out of it, only 2.2 billion acre is utilized for irrigation domestic, and the remaining is drained into the either into the Indus or into the sea. So my question is whether we do count that annual water production, annual water availability in the main national field. Um, question that. I have more than 29 years experience working in industry and my question is that do we have some integrated water, water source management plan for this because we are missing this data we have expanded this irrigation system without any calculation so in the past we don't have the plan and present at present I, I, was, I don't see any plan do we have in future plan of our this integrated water source management for this? Cool. All right. You have three questions. Okay. <laughs> So the first one, you know, uh, as, you, as you asked, you know, what are some four things that we can do through policy? So I don't know if I can tell you four things, but there are two things that I will certainly start with. I honestly feel that, you know, instead of the issue of deficit of water, our fundamental issue is deficit of trust. The provinces don't trust each other. The institutions don't trust each other. The people don't trust each other. And that is, I do believe, a, a, a really fundamental impediment that actually impedes, you know, good decision making. It impedes, you know, um, sort of better better action and better policy. And Kalabar Dam example is there. Uh, the, uh, the, it was, you know, part of the plans when the Indus Basin Treaty was 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 brought up. There were there were supposed to be three, and Kalabar squarely is a just. And it is squarely because of deficit of water, and so on and so forth, right? So I do believe that our biggest issue is not of deficit of water, but deficit of trust. I do believe that. Secondly, uh, and then, you know, I can actually, you know, I've looked at a lot of interesting research that has been done on innovation and on, you know, productivity and inventiveness. And that has been done at the firm level, so companies, so a lot of, you know, business scholars. And they actually highlight this issue that when organizations don't have trust, it actually limits their productivity and it limits their ingenuity and innovativeness. So organizations where there's a greater degree of trust, they can innovate more and they've measured it you know, through patents and various. So, but I do feel that this actually issue is not just about you know, firms and companies, but really stems across national scales. So I'm going to really you know, repeat this issue. The second point, so if the government and if the public, you know, together can really do greater social cohesion, I think a lot of our issues can be better managed and better. This is not an easy task. Yeah, I can put put that one as, you know, as the number one thing to do, but it's also the hardest. I, 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 I fully agree that, but, I'm, you know, uh, this is how I see it. Uh, and then secondly, number two um, is of transparency, which also is connected to the issue of trust. Uh, and when we're talking about water resources, you know, uh, I know that IRSA for years was trying to set up this telemetry system since, you know, the late early 2000s, you know, and so on and so forth. I don't know what the current status is, but we do need more transparency of, you know, of our water resources, how they're being used. Now, this data that I was showing you, for instance, that's actually a great step. So, Punjab Irrigation Department, you know, publishing this data, making it available, I think that's actually really commendable. And, and, and we need more of that. We need more organizations and more agencies doing that so that people like me and all their experts who are sitting here can actually go in and start you know, looking at this and analyzing it and then hopefully coming up with solutions and bringing it to attention to policymakers. So this issue of transparency is not just about accountability but also about opportunity. If we don't have our transparency and if we don't make these things, you know, public and share them with, uh, with you know, with, with the wider stakeholders, 
we are really going to lose out on opportunities that may come by when other people look at this problem and may, may offer ideas. So it, it transcends the issue of, of trust and accountability, but also opportunity when we talk about transparency. Uh, so those are you know two things that I would you know share on, on this issue uh, that I think can have can have a real impact as they relate to policy and so forth. Uh, how do we bring about again you know Competent question of social cohesion, maybe Danish and other political sciences. Yeah, Frequent and severe meetings. So, okay, and then going back to you know the question of um, uh, Balochistan's water resources and uh, and, and you know I mean, uh, connecting it with the total availability right. so and I the water volume available in Balochistan. That, that's a very good question, uh, sir. I honestly don't know. I'm not an expert on Balochistan's water resources. I've always been very curious because the data has been so lacking relating to Balochistan. The data that I used and I showed here was from FAO. And as you know, the UN organizations show country reported data. So, right, so they send out forms for countries to fill out. So, this is supposedly data that Pakistan, you know, reported to FAO and they basically compile it and show it. How that compilation was made, uh, I'm not, you know, privy to that. This is just, you know, official figures, quote unquote, as you're seeing them. But I think you're raising a great point that uh, we really should be taking a hard look to make sure that are we adequately looking at, at our national resources. Because that water is not all the time coming into the industry. Right. The right. water is going to the right. sea. So this was not just for the industry basin, right? So the data I showed so you was it's calculated on the entire Pakistan. population versus water available. Right. So for, water for available country. is only from the sources of the United States. For the country. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, there was a third question on the integrated water resources management. So sir, if so, you know, I was happy to hear that you've been working on this for 29 years, so you're the expert then, so you should be telling us what the, what the, what the, plans, what the plans are, right? So somebody, somebody, you know, rightly pointed out that it took us 70 years to, it, it took us, you know, 70 years to get to our national water policy, right? Uh, 70 years. So, uh, so the, I mean, these are questions, you know, fair and square to be asked. Uh, I have not seen any document on the integrated water resources management of Pakistan. This is the short answer. Okay. There's a question back there. There's a question back there. There's a question over here, and there's a question over here. All right. Okay. So this yeah. My question would be: okay, We're talking about SDGs everywhere in the world. Okay, by 2030, these are the things which should be the but should be given to every human being. Water is one of them. So when we're talking about such scale, we're talking about 70 years of not doing anything at all, and then next 12 years we're going to do miracles. <laughs> so for that, we do need people like you from MIT and different universities to come to these developing countries and give them the best possible solutions at a very minimum cost. Do you see that happening when you don't? Because if that's not going to happen, if that doesn't happen in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, we're not going to get that SDGs anywhere close to reality. Well, Ali, let's get the three. This is a question from a webinar. Somebody. Oh, OK. The question is, yeah. please go on. He says that the, uh, we're told that the water table is declining, but it is at a higher level than when the canal system started. Yeah. So can somebody or the speaker mention uh, what the conjective use and what we lose in 40% of the system doesn't even <coughs> add to a groundwater reservoir. So in that sense, isn't this system inefficiency a saving grace for us? In the fresh ground water zone. Sorry, but there's another question. Okay, so thank you Afreen, for the very good presentation and uh, thank you Arisa uh, for uh, developing this uh, new gift uh, um, to bringing people together. I have two, three small comments. One about this agriculture, which uh, everyone says it's 95%. Actually, you do not have storages. Only the storages are up there in maybe 15% of the area. The rest of 85% of the country has no storages. Once the water is released, you have to use it. You cannot use it in the cities. It will flood the city. It will flood the industry. So what? the only way to use it is to divert is for agriculture. So this is just to give you this, the, the people who say 95 percent, 95 because you do not have storages, you have to use it and that is the only way. 
And the other thing, because it augments your ground water as well. So once you spread it on the, uh, uh, the fields, actually it augments your irrigation. This is one thing. Uh, another important thing is that when we talk about water, actually it is uh, not that simple to understand water. It is connected all, all water. So when we talk about, for, for example, the, the water pricing, governance issues, then we water quality, then the storages. So they are so much connected. And the one thing I should tell you that in the 60s, Pakistan was the, the water Mecca, we can say the water vertical city in the, in the whole world. Why? Because there was a, the whole economy was actually being designed. Like not only agriculture and water and dams and link in us, but also industrial board, industry, other things, credit, agriculture bank, and productivity. So just understand that because the whole economy, when it is sluggish, water will also be suffering. And that is why sometimes we show uh, a bit of a worry that uh, if there is a problem. And lastly, <coughs> I hope you have, uh, you have read the uh, Indian the report of the uh, Composite Water uh, Index, <coughs> Composite Water Management Index, and reading that will give you a lot of knowledge that what's happening in India, and we can also continue our contribution in different way like this one. This is a very good because we are discussing different things. <coughs> Once you go back to your own silos, just start, just continue contributing, and we hope sometime. A political economy will also emerge, which will bring these dots connected, and we will have a very good water economy. Okay, I think since we had two specific questions, we could take one more question in this round. <coughs> Are you, do you still want to ask? I am. Go ahead. Um, you actually addressed a lot of large scale intervention. I was just wondering if it was possible to small scale interventions, like uh, humanitarian organizations. Not in uh, the local community setting. So I'm commenting more on um, accessibility to water, such as in Sin, where um, traditional methods are there, like RO plants, or in like the northern side where you um, work with um, gravity water schemes. Or, um, they're either in some cases really costly and also hard to maintain by the local community. So if you know of any commenting on Okay, so I'll address the question on the groundwater uh, topic from, from the webinar. I, I didn't get the whole question entirely, but understanding. Uh, yeah, actually, can you repeat, you the, repeat the question? The elements. One was that there is a false spell. Uh, along well that the water is diminishing, groundwater is diminishing, whereas it's higher than where it was before the canal system was introduced, 1857 or 56. Second is that we say that inefficient system, and we use 40% in the carriage system, and that 40% seeps into water, and that that's the saving grace, and that inefficiency in the system is helping us survive to provide so much water. Effect. So, so I, th I think so. That's that's a fair point. That in many places, actually, the groundwater you know levels are not decreasing. Uh, they're in fact fairly stable because of the high recharge that they're mentioning. You know, forty percent, as they say. But there are two points I think that that should be con uh, should be of concern. One is as you were seeing, you know, the chart in which I was showing the the future projections, uh, and this is related again to the climate change question as well. That in the future. If our surface supplies start getting impacted and we continue to rely on the groundwater abstraction and we have built our economy around that groundwater abstraction, it's going to be very painful. So we really need to understand what it is that we do with our groundwater and what the impacts of future uh, what surface supplies would be because of climate change and how that would severely impact uh, the groundwater recharge rates as well as groundwater availability overall. So just being strategic and knowledgeable one is important. The number two, uh, when we think about you know uh, groundwater, as I was just even mentioning, the issue of arsenic. So even in the freshwater cases, there's actually a lot that lurks underneath the ground that we don't understand. And what we don't know, what we don't understand, we cannot measure, we cannot control. Uh, we are not going to be able to use it as optimally. 
So just thinking that, oh, it's a saving grace and, you know, we just let the surface water, which does not have arsenic, uh, we, we put it back into the ground and the soil has mobilized arsenic in there and now we're pumping that pumping it back up with all kinds of unknown contaminants, I don't know if that's a very sane and smart strategy to be sort of relying on. So so this is something, you know, that I get actually personally very concerned about, that as soon as the water goes into, into the ground, there's a lot that we don't know what's happening to it. So particularly when we talk about, you know, just relying on, on the fresh water, you know, uh, and recharging it. So, so there are a lot of these complexities that are at play. So we in my opinion, shouldn't be just simply relying on the fact that the high recharge rates, you know, will carry us through. And just because we haven't seen the decline in the past, this will be the case in the future. And then the third point is that in some regions, there is a decline. We do see that happening uh, and something that should be, but by and large, yes. So we have not had, you know, significant declines as we originally, you know, sort of uh, expected, which is a good thing so for, for, the, for the current uh, time being. Now, going back, uh, what, what, uh, we had another question, uh, comment on the small-scale interventions. Was there another one? Yeah, I think it was more was of a one positive, about right? Why did you come back? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your deal? Like, why <laughs> <is> <laughs> the small-scale <laughs> Right, so for, for SDGs. So I think uh, since you were asking, you know, the role of sort of the Pakistani diaspora, you know, you're asking about the role of, you know, sort of international experts, uh, right, uh, and, and thinking about, you know, SDGs. So, uh, so you know, I think there's some great, uh, you know, new projects that are emerging and great new expertise that is emerging. Uh, here's, you know, one uh, uh, one colleague right here, Asif Khan, right, who just got his PhD from University of Cambridge. He's back in Pakistan and, you know, sort of leading some great innovative projects. And I see actually a number of people in Pakistan who have, you know, gotten advanced degrees in water resources, in, uh, in you know, environmental sciences and so forth, and are now contributing, you know, in, in thinking about both uh, advancing the science and thinking about policy. So that actually I see as a positive trend. Uh, and as a result of, uh, and partly I would say that uh, a lot of these, uh, this new effort has, uh, has come about because of new scholarships that were instituted in the last 10, 15 years. Pakistan is the biggest recipient of Fulbright scholarships, or one of the top two are the, are the top. That actually has made a big impact. And then secondly, uh, you know, a number of scholarships uh, for, for Europe and UK, even uh, you know, HEC, uh, you know, uh, gave a lot of scholarships. So that, we're now beginning to see, you know, the impact of, uh, of those investments in higher education uh, in Pakistanis. Is that adequate? Uh, I think we need more. We need more investment in education. We need more on higher education, and uh, and and the buck stops with you know our own policymakers. Our own policymakers need to invest in that education uh, and send you know more people for for expert training and so forth. Now talking about you know the uh, the SDGs and talking about you know using international experts. Uh, there's a uh, a number of groups that are now engaging uh, in looking at studies in Pakistan. Uh, one is actually, uh, you know, we, we just came back from a conference in Vienna. There are several people here sitting in the room who were there. Uh, there's great interest uh, at the uh, Institute for Advanced uh, Systems uh, Analysis, IASA, uh, to look at the space in detail. That, I think, is actually a promising sign. When there is interest from international research organizations to be looking at questions in Pakistan, because that helps both uh, clarify and improve policy both globally as well as locally. So that is happening. Now, talking about SDGs and, you know, more local engagement, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, this is something that I do think that, you know, Pakistani policymakers can do a better job of. I do see what happens in India. I do see what happens in China. I, I do see what happens in many countries that have large, you know, diasporas uh, who have experts and what, you know, they basically actively go out and seek uh, expertise, uh, and then they implement it. I actually do not see that level of engagement from the Pakistani government. Uh, it is a fact. So so this is something, you know, that our own policymakers need to sort of, you know, stay, you know uh, 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 need, need to come up to uh, and, and sort of engage with, because this is a resource that many other countries use very effectively uh, for, for their own gain. Um, and, 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 you know, closing with the questions on SDGs, you know, my own view is that, you know, we had the Millennium Development Goals and now we have the Sustainable Development Goals and these are all great goals and, you know, great things to be inspired by, but we're never going to achieve them unless they're locally owned. Are they locally owned? Are there our own goals? And even if somebody else came up with those goals, which with some great thought, which is great, but do we own them? 
Uh, and until we own them, and until we want them for ourselves, we're not going to get them. So, so this, you know, I think is again a question of, you know, public demand and awareness and, and wanting it for ourselves, because certainly it won't come down from the top. Uh, third, you know, question on, um, you know, small scale interventions. So there's a lot of exciting technologies, right, that are coming up, particularly for actually brackish water treatment. Uh, and, and desalinating water uh, for you know communities in uh, in sort of uh, desert regions, uh, and I think regions such as Kar and regions in you know southern Punjab, there are rainwater spheres and many others which will benefit from them. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, some work on solar water desalination for community scale that has been done. There are a number of technologies that have been developed. I know a few that have been developed at MIT as well as you know, many other universities around the world. So now there are systems that can feasibly you know, uh, treat brackish water and make it potable and fit for drinking just by using solar energy. Uh, and, and these systems are, are, can be excellent for deployment in remote communities and can have a huge impact on quality of life. You know, clean water, and that's the beginning of, of so many great things, ranging from you know, uh, human health and, and children, uh, you know, Third health and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so there are uh, treatment technologies that are, that are coming up at the local scale, designed for you know community use, particularly uh, for remote communities. And then there are you know uh, these other interventions that I think uh, that should be made for you know uh, the socioeconomically disadvantaged populations living in urban slums. Uh, I think that requires major intervention. If you look again, you know, at our population distribution, our large cities are growing pretty large, and I just returned from you know, a trip to Karachi, and, and you know, things are pretty pretty significant. So, uh, so there's a lot of intervention that can be made again in, in looking at water quality issues and, and cleaning it at the community level within cities. And I think if you work with municipalities and perhaps you know even you know the thousands of I mean, this is something that, that really needs to be addressed, uh, not just in remote communities, but also in large cities where people don't have access to clean water. And we're looking at, you know, resurgence of, of disease that really comes about because of lack of, you know, sanitation and, right, so TB and, and uh, you know, all of these are coming back in Karachi. And, you know, typhoid, uh, you know, breakfast and typhoid, Pakistan is one of the few countries where that has emerged. All of these things are related to lack of sanitation and, and bad, you know, management of places and so forth. So, so I think, uh, you know, we, we not only just need to look at, you know, the, the remote communities, but also the, uh, uh, and there are you know, opportunities for that as well. Uh, okay. I think if I do get subjected to that torture, maybe a uh, cup of tea is in order. <laughs> that sounds a great time. We can offer you. I think this was this has been the most rewarding experience. I, can, I think I can speak for the audience over here. Thank you so much for devoting that time and energy and good humor. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dadesh. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Commercial audio will take to that. Please join us for a cup of tea behind this wall. Those of you who can stay back. Um, the next talk is on an amazing topic I didn't know anything about. But we found someone, someone on a webinar who just did a dissertation on. Uh, on Turkey Armenia transporting water agreement. Uh, it predates uh, Armenia's independence from uh, yeah, it's so, so it's a very interesting topic. The date is now in question because the date we had fixed with the speakers was on 24th that the election day. 25th. 25th. So we're trying to make it 27th because what we're doing that And those of you who are interested in future talks, uh, there's a flyer here. Um, please join us. Thank you very much, Dr. Abhiyamansi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.